Well, it's my honor and privilege to welcome Miss Ruth Darley from Spanglish Fantastico YouTube channel. Ruth, thanks for hanging out with me today. Hola, Dani. Es un placer to be here on your show, on your podcast. Sí, sí para mí también. Um, you, know, you know, I get a lot of questions uh, from viewers that they say, what's the best way to learn Spanish? What do I need to do to get there quickly? So I just kind of wanted to talk to you about that a little bit today. But first thing I wanted to ask you is what got you interested in Spanish? How did you start with it? Um, I I didn't even do Spanish in school. So I did French in school. Oh, me too. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was absolutely stunned when I went to France and found that I could communicate with people. Right. <laughs> oh my goodness, that, this works. It's a good feeling, isn't it? <laughs> it is, it is. It's a great feeling. And, um, and I had a, a German friend as well. Uh, so I used to go and visit her and just muddle on, even though I never had German lessons. So I, I've been to her house. We're still friends now, lots and lots of times. And, and it's muddling on. So uh, I started learning Spanish when I enrolled for a teaching course in Barcelona. Okay. And I, thought I better get some, better get some night, night classes of Spanish. All right. Under my belt, and I uh, so I, I had a couple of lessons, and that really wasn't up my street. I went to Barcelona, and it was wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a few little Spanish lessons there, but again, that wasn't really for me. I liked to just try to communicate. Right. Um, and then it wasn't until so that was 1998. It wasn't until 2001 that I got. Um, the opportunity to travel to Peru. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, really nice. And I worked in the mornings, Danny. I worked um, from 7 till 9 a.m. And then I worked in the evening. So I had the daytime free. Nice. And yeah, uh, oh, the life of Riley. Uh, so what I did was um, <laughs> uh, to <laughs> my poor parents, I, uh, I decided to learn paragliding. And um, you, you would sit in the park with your paraglider waiting for the wind to be right. Uh -huh. Everybody else was Peruvian. They're all chatting in Spanish and I'm listening in. And every now and then, you know, people talked English as well. So I would right. have those conversaciones, but trying to tune into the language. So that was, that was the listening part of it. Mm -hmm. And people would say to me, oh, Ruth, do you, do you understand what we're talking about? And I said, well, something about computers. <laughs> I'm not getting all the details, <laughs> right? But just trying to listen and uh, and trying to join in a little bit. But the big thing for me was reading. Um, we we didn't really have the internet um, like it is now. It was a, it was a very primitive beast in those days. And right. Uh, but so so reading. I didn't have access to all these beautiful videos and apps that you have now reading and what I would do was go through a book in a bookshop and just read a paragraph at random and if I could understand some of it mm -hmm. then I'd buy that book okay and I'd, and I'd make notes just the most ridiculous amount of notes so I would write down all the stuff that I understood mm -hmm. because um for me language is about the bits you can understand and mm -hmm. if i don't understand it it's not interesting for me so i right. had to understand it and i made big collections of of the the spanish that i understood and I, and, I, and by the end of the book you know by the end of the book you'd pick up vocabulary specific to that book right um so so those that's what i would that's still still my my preferred path probably uh -huh. When, okay. I get to, when I get to just past that little beginner hump mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where, you know, you, you need the support. When I get past that, right. my preferred path is, is reading, reading copiously. Well, I, you know, I, I've talked about this on some of my live videos, I think. Um, I did a lot of the same. I did a lot of reading in college, obviously, um, in what you're talking about. But I found that listening to music and doing the same process, I, I'm trying to get what I can get and then write down what I did not understand. Go back, look those up, break them down, look at the context, how is it being conjugated, how is it used? Obviously, because context changes, we 
we say something in English, you know, we say, what's up? Well, that doesn't really make any sense, but we're just saying, how's it going? Um, so I would look at context like that, go back and listen to the song again. And I found that I learned an enormous amount of Spanish listening to Selena. <laughs> so Selena, I was going to ask you, who do you listen to? Yeah, I, I mean, I know she's been gone a long time, but I still listen to her. You know, she was great, mm -hmm. but anyway, mm -hmm. but those sing along, sing along at least, yeah. even sometimes not out loud, but singing along. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but getting those bits and pieces and reprocessing, I think, is a big part of improving your speaking and comprehension. And it's tuning, tuning your mouth in, isn't it, when you're doing yes. that to to those exact um, uh, intonation patterns and those, mm -hmm. you know, the, getting the sounds just right. Right. Um, yeah, the, I like uh, Estopa. I don't know if you've heard of them. And Joaquim so. Sabina. Okay, uh, that's a familiar name too. Yeah, yeah lovely poetry in his music. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you have a degree in Spanish? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So you've had to study it in, in very heavy detail. It's, it's heavy going. It is. And, I, you know, people ask me all the time, what's the best way to, you know, learn Spanish? And, and part of me wants to say, well, just become a Spanish major. But I know that's <laughs> not feasible for everybody. But I, I, for me, it was from day one, going into Spanish one, most of the class was in Spanish, even though we we're just learning to say, hola, como esta, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But the sitting every single day, Monday through Friday, for several different classes and it's all in Spanish and you're having to keep up or you don't pass. And for mm -hmm. me, that was the yeah, best. Absolutely. Absolutely. in that study, but that study doesn't work for everybody. Um, right. My daughter's 15 and she's very good at Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, and she's just doing her um, in England. We have GCSEs, which are the standardized tests that you finish when you're 16 and then you can go and do a level, which is another two years of school, which is optional. OK. And um, and she's not going to do Spanish at A level because she doesn't her her kind of literature is isn't so highbrow. She doesn't like the classics. She doesn't like um, complex, advanced literature that you have to analyze. And that's what you have to do at the higher level of studies in, in England, in university and A, a level. You have to right. do that. Right. Whereas she would rather, she's happy reading The Simpsons in Spanish or, uh, right. you know, or Horrid yeah. Henry in Spanish or, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. It, it, so so the, those higher level studies definitely get you a very high level of Spanish, but it just, I, I would say it wouldn't float everybody's boat. Right. And yeah, I remember in college, you're talking about literature. Um, of course, we read tons of literature in college, but I remember reading uh, Don Quixote. And we had a final exam once and the teacher who uh, was just, she knew everything there is to know about Spanish grammar. Um, she said, here's your final exam. You're going to pick one literary work and you're going to write about it. You got two hours. And so, you know, you think two hours to, to write about one story, but boy, when she said write about it, you better talk about the author, the historical context at the time that author was alive, his life, how this, what happened in the story, you know, and all the symbolism, you better discuss it. And I remember frantically starting to write by hand, not on computer. And two hours later, we were booking it to finish up. And I remember writing 22 pages handwritten pages Ooh. in that two hours, all about the Don Quixote. So there's just so much to that story and tons of other stories that you can break down. Yeah, so there's that discipline, isn't there? That you have to do it. So what I'm doing now that, um, that, that I'm really enjoying is um, I have an audio book and I, in Spanish and I have the English text and I, I started trying to translate the English text and, and I found it, oh, you know, this is really hard work. Yeah. <laughs> and so what I'm doing instead um, is, uh, is using it as my relaxation um, because it's a wonderful book. It's um, a, a New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. And I, I really like his, I really like his writing. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so I'm listening 
to it in Spanish and just, just looking at the English and going, oh, that's how they're translating that. Oh, I wouldn't have used that. But yeah, that I see how that works. And so that's I, that doesn't take a huge amount of discipline because it's all fairly, it's not productive. It's all receptive. Mm -hmm. um, right. And, and, and I, I, I am really enjoying that. With the grammar, um, I, did a, I did an open university diploma, which isn't as as depth as in depth as as a degree so okay. in england you need 360 points to get your degree oh. and the the course that i did was university level but it was only 120 points i think oh okay or 180 maybe um and and then you had to do french to make up the other points so right. uh <laughs> so so and and there wasn't an awful lot of grammar in it it was it was about culture, about literature. It was about different styles of writing, newspapers, things like that. Uh, but uh, but not a lot of grammar. So I got this qualification, which uh, allowed me to teach Spanish mm -hmm. in higher education, in, in in you know in uh, post compulsory education, uh, so adults. And uh, and I didn't really know the grammar very well, so I learned it teaching it. So <laughs> I don't okay. know if that's particularly helpful to to, yeah. uh, to to your students and listeners, but um, I do think this. Say say somebody's wanting to to learn some some of the grammar points from perhaps the language tutor um, uh, videos, which which I think are great. Um, uh, I would I would recommend this as you're watching take notes mm -hmm. as if you were then going to try to teach it to somebody else. Right. Yes. Because, because then you have to be sure, because if you're going to present it to, to two or more other people, or even just one other person, you're going to have to be sure that you, does that have an accent on it? And what's the ending if it's that? And, mm -hmm. and yeah, so. That, that's an amazing point. I have thought about that so many times with, you know, a lot of people don't know, I, I actually teach in public school as a full-time job. I, I can't tell you how many times I've looked at that one kid who doesn't always do really well in the class and try to give them some leadership and say, hey, listen, I, I, I want you to um, try to break this down for the class. You know, it, I call it the student teacher. It, you know, we think of student teachers, people learning how to teach, but the student as a teacher, you give them some authority and make them feel like the teacher and the master of the uh, subject matter that you're teaching. And all of a sudden they just feel empowered and they understand it backwards and forwards because they had to take charge of it. Yeah, it, that's it's great. A, it's a great strategy to feel that way. And, and it changes your mindset, I believe. How on earth do you have time to do everything that you do? <laughs> People say that. They say you're the busiest guy in the world. The, the busiest guy I know. But I, honestly, I'm I'm not that busy. <laughs> I I have a lot of free time. <laughs> so, but when when I am free though, I kind of get bored and I sit there going, "All right, what am I going to do? What I, what can I accomplish? I need to be doing something." Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I love that, and I love that. Um, uh, in in schools, I was working in schools until uh, December, and then I've uh, taken a break to do other things. Mm -hmm. um, but in schools, where I see the most successful lessons is when um, is when the the students are doing a large percentage of the talking, nice and uh, as directed. So this is what your this is what your task is, and I want to hear it from you. Mm -hmm. and and it is i watched a, a wonderful wonderful student teacher um and uh and he really kept his talking to an absolute minimum and he was like the conductor of the class getting the students to do the speaking so there and and that's something that i did with, with uh with learning spanish as well um so collecting all these phrases but i would find the odd one that i really liked and then i'd pop it in my back pocket and I'm going to be able to use that right. <laughs> and literally pull it out of my back pocket when when I had an opportunity to to, to use it uh -huh. to comic effect or something is like, uh -huh, right. I, I know what you're thinking or whatever whatever the sentence was in pero en español 
uh-huh. uh, uh, and uh, and so, so that was a nice way to to start and to try to to try to uh, delight people in a way uh, because that's what language is about isn't it it's about right. um you you're using somebody else's language you're making the effort to use somebody else's language and it's delightful mm-hmm. it's, We've got a lot of um, Ukrainians coming over um, yeah. now. So as far as I'm aware, it's probably about 65,000 um, over here. So the United Kingdom's like a, an American state. You know, we, mm-hmm. the, the population of, of perhaps Georgia is like the population of the United Kingdom. OK, yeah. So, so, that, so, so, so that, that's to give you the context for 65,000. So we have, a, we have a few families in, uh-huh. in my area. And um, I'm trying to get people to learn a few words of Ukrainian because it's it's beautiful to try mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. to use somebody else's language in in right. the United States. You have so many Spanish speakers. You try to use un poco de español, mm-hmm. and it lights people up, doesn't it? It really does. It really does, and and it helps them out too. Uh, these I can't imagine what these people are going through right now, and to have somebody just reach out in, in a simple way of trying to learn a few phrases just to make them feel like somebody's on their side. Absolutely. You can make a world yeah. of difference for somebody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what, that's what it's about. I, I want to I ask you, mm. oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, just, just, just a final word on, on that. Yeah. Um, I think as well, you know, um, when people are moving away from, from their own country and their own culture, um, then if you're learning their language, it's like saying you don't have to abandon it all because exactly. we're going to meet you in the middle. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And I try to put myself in that, that position. You know, what if this were happening where I live in Georgia and, and my home was destroyed, everything you worked for. I mean, this, this is a pain that most of us don't understand. have never gone through. And mm-hmm. it just, it's really, it hurts a lot to know that families are dealing with this. So, um, and you, speaking of Ukraine, you, can you tell a little bit about your book that you, you did a while, a couple months ago? Mm, yeah, well, um, I have, I have a book called um, uh, a Spanish phrase book for educators. And that mm-hmm. is, that was written for a teacher in the United States who had um, Spanish speakers coming into her primary class, into her infants class. Mm-hmm. Um, so these aren't people who are going to be able to use the Google Translate so easily. They're not going to be right. able to read it, although it's advanced a bit more since then, perhaps. Um, so anyway, I wrote a phrase book. And then when the war in Ukraine broke out, I thought I'll put that into Mm-hmm. A, a Ukrainian context and work right. with a couple, of, a couple of ladies online to do that. Um, and um, I mean, I'm I'm a single mom, uh, Danny, so I, I'm okay. not able to donate massively to, to to charities to support people. But by doing right. that, I've been able to to raise mm, is it's going to be it's going to be approaching a thousand dollars now. So wow. I'm pleased to have done that. As, uh, that goes to the Disasters Emergency Committee. Yeah, so that's that called Ukrainian One Day at a Time. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so I'm pleased with that. I'm pleased with that. That's amazing. Um, and, and what I've done now as well, um, I've worked with uh, the British Association of Teachers for the Deaf. So they have a, a magazine which is for mainstream education and they've put just the phrases for school part of the book they've put that out in their magazine so i'm wanting to get that out to anybody who might come into contact with ukrainian people mm-hmm. because um so that can go that just goes out free as a pdf um to anyone who can use it Great. um and then i'm creating lessons for teachers to use in school. So little 10 minute lessons just to get their classes, their English speaking classes to use a little bit of Ukrainian. Yeah. To, again, just to help welcome people. Yeah. Well, now speaking of the um, deaf people, have you ever ventured into a- to sign language? Oh, I, I did that. Yes, yes. I, when you teach in schools, what age group do you teach? When they come to our school, a few of them are still 10 years old. Most okay. of them are 11, but when they leave, they're about 14 years old. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, um, well, 
I work with with school children a little bit younger than that, and mm. um, I I learned a little bit of sign language. So English sign language and American sign languages, all the sign languages, they're all different languages. So that's pretty right. good. Um, but using a little bit of of British British sign language. Um, in my Spanish lessons was really helpful for the younger children. So I'm talking more sort of eight, nine, 10. And okay. um, they were, you know, we would, we would do uh, color songs and things like that. And I would teach them the sign language to go with it. So it becomes like almost a dance, but there's always something to do with your hands. When you're speaking, there's something to do with your hands. Right. You've got the orange, you've got the pink and the, green and, and the purple and all these different colors so so that worked really well in terms of um keeping the children engaged because there's too much sitting still mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and by giving them something very specific to do with their hands um uh, that that really worked well so yeah. i think it's a pity that the the sign language of any given nation isn't incorporated into basic teacher training because right. it just seems like it just seems like a missed opportunity for a whole community not to be brought in mm-hmm. via their language yeah i i've thought about it i i was on a tv show last year do you are you familiar with the show the walking dead uh, yeah i can't yeah. watch it I'm too sweet. No, I, I was working on that show last year and there are two actors actresses on there who um one is deaf and the other one she's in real life she's losing her hearing so there and i got put in a scene with both of them and so i'm sitting there just thinking to myself man alive i've i've thought about learning sign language so many times i wish i had started this a year ago because, you know, we're having to sit there with an interpreter and all this. But I, I think that I've tried to decide what is my next language? I think that may be it. I don't know. Danny, would you ever use sign languages on your videos? So where you're, where you're doing your language tutor, the Spanish tutor, would you, would you ever use sign language at the same time? Because compl- you can teach two languages simultaneously. I'm completely open to the idea. I, yeah. If I could get proficient at it, I would love to bring it in. We've we've talked. Our team has talked about can we bring sign language onto the channel? We're working on trying to get Italian on there right now, but uh, mm-hmm. we would love oh. sign language. Oh, I would love to see that. That would be. Thank you. I I don't have any idea about um, what kind of percentage of the population use sign language, but I don't either. That's a, that's an interesting point. Um, definitely something we're open to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wonder. And I think as well with with language. You know, if you're learning Spanish and mm-hmm. you and you have, you could learn Spanish alongside American Sign Language. Right. And then and then, they, I just think they would support each other. I, I think. do. I agree. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, on the a while ago, you mentioned about listening in Peru. You were listening to people. Mm -hmm. one thing that I tell people is, you know, you remember the old theory in the seventies about, I'm going to put my headphones on and listen to it while I sleep. Mm -hmm. We know that doesn't work. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. uh, in in order to process language, you have to be actively processing. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that when I've learned languages, I get to the point where my brain is just tired. I I mean, I feel physically tired from sitting there in another language all day. Mm -hmm. Do you find the same thing? Um, Yes, yes, definitely. And, and it's, it's, it's very heavy on the head is how I I would describe it. That's Mm -hmm. exactly it. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I think, you know, you should immerse yourself as much as possible. But if I think the breaks are good, you know, for anybody that's listening, wondering, you know, about immersing yourself, take a break every once in a while, because, you know, you get to the point where it's the end of the day and you're so tired and it heavy on the head, as you're saying. And sometimes that's something that will take away the motivation because I don't know if I can do this every day. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I would recommend to people, 
take a break for your native language. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and I would say, make it a proper break. So, right. so a, a break isn't, isn't going and doing something else that's really heavy cognitive load. It's mm -hmm. having a proper break is, is mm -hmm. getting out and just watching the birds in the garden or something. Exactly. Right, mm -hmm. right. I wanted to end by uh, talking about your, your YouTube channel and your books and things like that. What, can you talk about your YouTube channel a little bit? Um, I, I, my YouTube channel really started during lockdown when I did uh -huh. 100 Days of Spanish. And it's, it's such a lovely journey, you know, finding out what this, this medium is. Um, and I'm really enjoying making videos. So uh, I've done a few uh, videos. I think I've done eight days of, of learning Spanish when I came across Dan Hall's book, which is mm -hmm. a Spanish language learning journal where you, you keep um, a track of all the things that you're learning and it's got a sort of built-in recall system. Um, right. So, so I, I, promoted that on day eight and uh and then I met Dan through that and and so then this community starts to build mm -hmm. and uh and and you've got people making comments and you're responding to the comments and you're you're, you're seeing you know what people want to be covered and you're covering that uh so I did my 100 days and then I went and uh, oh, I did um I did a daily word builder series as well. And that comes from Dan's book where he has a word of the week and looks mm -hmm. at seven different aspects of that word. So I made, I mean, I did such a, a marathon, really. I did 182 videos for that. Um, nice. One a day. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, and then I started teaching um, from the course book that I taught adults with. Um, and, uh, and I slowed them down. Um, uh, I started writing my books in 2014. What I wanted to do in my classes, I was using a mixture of English and Spanish because I was finding my students wanted to just stay in English. Mm -hmm. and, and I say, no, look, you, that's, that's a word, una palabra, that you know en español. So I would like you to use that palabra in Espanol. So I started talking Spanglish uh, as a model for my students, my estudiantes to mm -hmm. copiar. Um, and then I thought, well, I'm going to try and write this down. So I wrote, uh, I wrote Spanglish Fantastico, the book. Um, I wrote Spanglish for your holiday, um, which I've just revised. And it's about creating a model of if you know la palabra en español, use that palabra en español because you can, once you're starting to use un poco de español, it accretes. Mm -hmm. It starts to stick and it starts to get bigger and bigger until you find that you're talking, you know, hopefully at the end of my books, um, you get to the end of the book and you're finding you're reading massive sections that are just en español. Yeah nada de inglés mm -hmm. and, and so that's the idea to to provide a model and I that's what I wanted to start to try to do on my channel and um I've just today actually started to to read this is my this is my updated Spanglish for your holiday I decided the online community were telling me that that they like puzzles so I decided to put more puzzles, more activities in. So you're not just reading, you know, you're, you're getting engaged mm -hmm. very much for beginners. Um, and I would say that, that reading is the best way para mí to, to, to learn Espanol. Um, but it's difficult to jump straight in as a beginner. So right. the idea of my books and my channel is to provide a bridge so mm -hmm. that you could go from this to then on to perhaps The Simpsons or Mafalda, which is a beautiful cartoon, or, um, or maybe something like The Little Prince by Santa Exuberi en right. Español. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so it's a bridge. It's a first step. And that's, that's la idea behind, behind that. Awesome. And your books, are they, where can our listeners uh, buy your books? Oh, they're on Amazon. 
Okay. So, yep, there's the the jokes to help you learn Spanish, which uh, you read from on your on your podcast. Yes. Wonderful. Um, and there's Spanglish for your holiday. Um, I've also got a book that I think is is really good, and some of the teachers in in England are using it. If you have young children, um, then I've made a version of Peter Rabbit in okay. Spanglish, so you can introduce. When I talk my daughter Spanish when she was very little she I had lots of storybooks for her and she didn't like me reading them in Spanish she would tell me in English so I compromised yeah. and you know the, the elephant was un elefante do you want to say it in, so you understand that that's fine <laughs> yeah yeah just go with <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I so I've I've created a, a Peter Rabbit book like that with a lot of suggestions for activities and I got a lovely a lovely note from a teacher last week saying that she's doing um, Peter's family tree for the family. They're doing a meal for Peter for the food. They're making a scarecrow for Mr. McGregor's garden to revise the quilts. And she got all these different activities going on in her class. Honestly, it made my week. It was lovely to hear that, that, uh, that they're having fun with it. That's, That's amazing. Fun. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put some links to your YouTube channel in the description for this podcast episode. Also to some of your books, I'll put Amazon links there as well. So I want to encourage everybody mm -hmm. listening to definitely uh, subscribe to Spanglish Fantástico and uh, pick up some of these books. I have a few myself and they are great books. I, I love them. So it really will enhance your learning and trying to learn Spanish. So definitely check them out. Perfecto. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias a usted. Thank you very much for talking with me today. This has been great. Es un placer. Un placer hablar con, con, contigo. Can we tutea? Can I can I say contigo? Oh, sí, sí. Por favor. Sí, sí. Contigo. Yeah.